call to worship from Psalm 57 this morning. It says, I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. We want you to experience God's great love in this place this morning. And as you do, I pray we just stir up praise within your heart today as we lift our hands and our hearts to him in worship this morning. Would you stand together? Let's open in a word of prayer today. Heavenly Father, we gather together as the body of Christ, the family of God. And we are so grateful for one another. Lord, these people that you have placed us in the body with, and Lord, it is a joy to encourage one another, love each other, pray with each other, lift each other up. Lord, it is a joy to worship together and exalt your holy name. So Jesus, be exalted in the house this morning. Lord, fill each one with your great love today. And Holy Spirit, come. Dwell in the midst of this people today. We ask it in the precious, precious name of Jesus this morning. Amen. Amen. Let's worship our Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, your love reaches to the sky. There's no space between you and I. Wherever I go, never alone, I'm waking up, I come alive, the past is gone, the future can wait, oh my soul, what a beautiful day, what a beautiful day, I breathe you in. Shout out your praise, oh my soul, what a beautiful day, what a beautiful day, your face, brighter than the sun, oh your grace, rewrites every wrong.
this morning. It's true, as the death is defeated, the king is alive. Hallelujah. Just a couple of reminders. The offering plate is at the back of the church if you want to give that way this morning. Uh, you can also give at uh, evangelchurch at bellnet.ca by email transfer. We appreciate your giving. We have fallen a little bit behind uh, so far this year, and so uh, anything you can do to help out would sure be appreciated. Uh, just a reminder as well, a shoe boxes for Operation Christmas Child, they are due November 13th. So we have two more weeks to get them in, and a great way to bless some children around the world. And also where they're allowed to, they share openly the message of Jesus Christ, and they see tons of kids come to know the Lord through this. So fill up those shoe boxes, bring them in. If you have any questions, there is a pamphlet inside each box that will... Uh, probably answer them for you. And so hope that helps out. Reminder again, Bible study this Thursday night, 7 o'clock, meeting right here studying the book of Esther. It's been really, really good. And so uh, just don't take my word for it. Come on out and experience it for yourselves. I will let you remain seated as we continue to worship this morning. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails, and all my days been held in your hands. Moment that I wake up, till I lay my head, I will sing the goodness of God. All my life. good 
this morning. give back praise to him we trust him for our future we trust him with the past and we trust him in the present he's great and mighty nothing escapes his eyes which is a good thing
just trust him this morning. Great are you, Lord. We trust you, Jesus. Great are you, Lord. Your eyes are on the sparrow. talk to our Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, you are great. You are mighty. You are awesome. You are above all. But Lord, we are so grateful at the same time. You have chose to come near to your children. Lord, not just in sending your Son and having him die for our sins, but Lord, also sending your Spirit to be here with us. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are the God of all comfort. And right now you are pouring out abundant grace and mercy and love and compassion in your children. And Lord, for this as well, we say, great are you, Lord. And Father, we are thankful for the reminder this morning, Lord, that whatever our situation, whatever our need, we have a great God, greater than all things, greater than sin, greater than lack, greater than confusion, greater than our enemy. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Well, let that message ring in our spirits this morning. Our God is a great God. Hallelujah. Lord, let it bring the hope and healing, deliverance that we need today. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Amen and amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. We serve a great God, people. Hallelujah. Let's get our Bibles out today. And let's say our pledge together. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. Today I will be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess my mind is alert, my heart is receptive. I will never be the same. I am about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever living seed of the Word of God. I will never be the same. Never, never, never. I will never be the same. In Jesus' name. Amen. I want to speak on the topic of grace this morning. Grace is greater. I wonder if you've ever had somebody rub it in when you really missed something incredible. Uh, you missed it, buddy. The concert was amazing. Sorry you couldn't come along with us on the cruise. <laughs> you missed an incredible vacation. Um, uh, too bad you missed out on the barbecue. The ribs were out of this world. What a tragedy. You missed Pastor Rob's sermon last week. It was epic. Right. Fear not. It's online. You can still see it. <laughs> uh, there's a little verse in Hebrews 12, 15 that appeals to us. It says, see to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See, when we miss grace, a, a bitter root begins to grow. The word bitter carries with it actually the idea of poisonous. So when we uh, miss grace, things actually become toxic. Religion without grace is poisonous. Church without grace is poisonous. A, a heart without grace is poisonous. A relationship without grace is poisonous. The, the, the bitter root may be small and slow in its growth, but eventually the poison does take over. Experiencing the, the greatness of God's grace has a, a positive effect on our lives, though. 
But when we miss grace, the poison of bitterness and anger will eventually become too much to keep buried. The poison of guilt and shame will eventually destroy us all. Possibly the, the simplest, but I think also an accurate definition of grace is the unmerited favor of God towards people. Uh, the most important place that we need to experience God's grace, obviously, is with regards to our sin. Romans 3.23 states, everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. There are no exceptions. Uh, our ability to appreciate grace is in direct correlation to the degree to which we acknowledge our need of it. The more we recognize the, the ugliness of our sin, the more we can appreciate the beauty of God's grace. When it comes to the sin in our lives, everything in us wants to deny, compare, minimize, and justify. And as long as we approach sin with that kind of spirit, we won't be able to experience the power and greatness of God's grace. Most of us think, I'm not that bad. We work hard at convincing ourselves and others that we're not that bad. But the truth is, we are worse than we ever imagined. <laughs> Amen, Pastor. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And, and, you know, the more that we push back on that, uh, the more we, we push back on experiencing God's grace. If we miss the reality and depth of our sin, we miss out on the grace of God. And as long as we think, I'm not that bad, grace will never seem that good. And so here are three ways that we try to convince ourselves that we aren't that bad. Number one, we compare ourselves to others. Sure, we don't claim to be perfect, but when we compare ourselves to someone else, well, we don't seem so bad after all, right? <laughs> what they did compared to what I did is like the equivalent of jaywalking, right? <laughs> we, we, we dismiss our sin and our need for grace by comparing ourselves with others. All the while, our pride and our self-righteousness further illustrate our sinful nature. Number two. Uh, we weigh the bad against the good. Uh, we, we put the good we have done on one side of the scale, and we put the bad on the other, and we figure we're just fine. All along we fail to realize what Isaiah 64, 6 says. We are all infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. You ain't that good. Right? <laughs> Three, we cover up and we minimize our sin. As a result, we're also covering up grace. In minimizing sin, we are diminishing the joy that comes with forgiveness. Jesus uh, didn't try to make people feel better about themselves by diminishing the seriousness of their sin and falsely reassuring them that they weren't that bad. Jesus explained that the one who is forgiven much, loves much. And he paralleled our love for God with the degree of forgiveness that we have received. One pastor once said, if the biggest sinner you know isn't you, then you don't know yourself very well. <laughs> and that mirrors what the Apostle Paul said about himself. 1 Timothy 1.15, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And you thought he put a period there, but he didn't. He said, of whom I am the worst. Paul was a pretty bad guy prior to becoming a Christ follower. He hunted down Christians. He had them imprisoned. He even participated in a stoning. Yet he doesn't say he was the worst of sinners, but I am the worst of sinners. If the Apostle Paul could come to that conclusion, do we really think we are any different? Romans 5.12 tells us we've all been diagnosed with sin and our condition is terminal. It says when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. And then Paul introduces us to an antidote 
called grace in verse 17. For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. Okay, it's going to turn around now. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness for all who receive it. It will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. And so, and so Paul sets up this equation. On one side of the equation is our sin, and our sin is worse than we can imagine, and we can minimize it, and we can rationalize it, and we can try to dismiss it, but we're terminally ill. And on the other side of the equation is God's grace. And when Christ died on the cross, his blood wasn't infected by sin, and he became the antidote that cures us. And after putting our sin on one side and God's grace on the other, Paul solves the equation. He says, grace is greater. God's wonderful grace. All right, for you, for you visual learners, it might look something like this. Here's our sin on the one side. And yes, we're bad. And it's real. All right? And there's nothing we can do about it. But because of the second Adam, because of Jesus Christ, and all he's done for us, and his blood that washes away our sins, grace is greater. Amen? That means you've done nothing so horrible that grace can't cover it. Grace is always greater, no matter what. The only way for grace to be experienced is for us to personalize our need. So again, for you visual learners, I'm here to help you. I have an equation for you. Grace is greater than blank. All right? Now you fill in the blank That's right. with your worst sin. Fill it in. All right? And, and whatever you put there, this is true. Grace is greater than that. The greatness of God's grace means... We don't have to keep trying to convince ourselves that we're not that bad. The truth is that we're worse than we ever wanted to admit, but God's grace is greater than we've ever imagined. Grace is greater than your sin, and, and here's another wonderful truth. Grace is bigger than your brokenness. God's grace has a way of, of chasing us down. It's relentless. In John chapter 4, we read of a, a lady, and she had this collision course with grace. Jesus went out of his way to go to a place called Samaria. There was a lot of prejudice uh, and hatred that existed between the Jews and Samaritans. And Jesus didn't let that stop him. He had a divine appointment at a well. And Jesus arrived at the well around noon. This was not a time when most people came to draw water early morning or, or late evening were better. It was just a, a much cooler journey. Nevertheless, Jesus encountered a, a lone woman at the well. And it was also very unusual for a woman to travel alone for safety reasons. And what we soon discover is that this woman had a, a rough past. She had a bad reputation. She may have been alone because people avoided her or she avoided people. Her only company was really her shame and her rejection. And so when Jesus asked for a drink, it kind of set her back a bit. She couldn't believe that a Jew would ask such a thing of a Samaritan. And Jesus responded by saying he had access to living water that could change her life. And she found this a little confusing, so Jesus decided to take the direct approach. And he asked her to go get her husband. And she admitted that she did not have a husband. And Jesus told her he was fully aware she wasn't married at the time, but had been five other times and was now living with another man. Jesus didn't step away from the truth. 
He described the reality of what she had done and the mess that her life had become. The well of relationships that she had kept drawing from wasn't quenching her thirst. And Jesus was not about to pretend that everything was okay. If she was going to receive his grace, she needed to stop hiding her sin. This is hard. We would love to find another way. But here's the truth. Before we, we collide with the grace of God, we must collide with the truth of our own sin. And Jesus speaks some, some difficult truths. It's part of the collision with grace that, that we try our best to avoid. When the truth about your life is hard to face, when you've made such a mess of things that, that you don't even know where to start cleaning up, when you can't forgive yourself, and the grace and, and shame of it all are your constant companions, it's hard to imagine that grace is available to you. We often think, uh, the worst thing that could happen to us is that our sins will be found out and our secrets exposed. We don't want anyone to know. And since God already knows, we do our best to avoid Him too. We fear being forced to confront the truth. However, that is not the worst thing. The worst thing that could happen is that we go through our lives with nobody knowing or finding out. We just carry the weight of our guilt and shame around with us everywhere we go. The worst thing that could happen is that we spend our lives trying to outrun God because we think he's chasing us to punish us when he's really chasing us to give us grace and forgiveness. So the woman at the well, she made some false assumptions about Jesus. Assumptions that, that many of us tend to believe as well. She assumed Jesus wanted nothing to do with her. When we assume Jesus doesn't want anything to do with us, uh, then there is a good chance uh, we've never had much interest in him. It's not that we don't want grace. Why, who wouldn't want grace? It's that we're convinced that grace doesn't want us. The woman at the well also assumed Jesus was making an offer that was too good to be true. She had trouble believing in water that could forever quench her thirst. Many men had probably made her all kinds of promises that they never delivered on. And she was skeptical and cynical that this guy might just be another one of them. See, wrong assumptions about Jesus, they're, they're like brick walls that we put up and they separate us from his grace. Jesus does want to welcome you into his family and let his grace flow over your life. His promises are the real thing, even if it seems like they are too good to be true. We need to let the walls come down and let his grace pour in. Before the woman at the well met Jesus, she, she avoided people. It was quite likely she had trouble forgiving herself for what she had done and the person that she had become. When her life collided with God's grace, she, she saw things differently. She ran and she told everyone in the village about Jesus. When God's grace and mercy collide with our shame and guilt, it's messy, but it's beautiful. Jesus knows everything we ever did, but he wants to make sure we know his grace is greater. When we miss grace and, and live with guilt, that guilt usually surfaces in regret and shame. And, and there's a difference between the two. Regret is feeling bad about something that you have or haven't done. Shame is feeling bad about who you are and who you think you're, uh, or how you think you're perceived by God and other people. So the woman at the well must have had regrets. But her struggle was probably living in the shadow of her shame. Her life had become defined by her mistakes and her poor decisions. Shame is connected with our identity, while regret is more about something specific we did or didn't do. 
Most of us can think of a time in our lives uh, that we would give just about anything to have back. We would do things differently. In hindsight, we can see the, the negative effect of our choices and how they've affected ourselves and others. All of us have regrets. Many of us are desperate to be free from the guilt and the regrets that imprison us. Our regrets should lead to remorse. That's the right response when we're confronted with our sin. God's grace won't leave us there. But that's where God's grace will most often find us. Unfortunately, when we come face to face with our guilt, we often do everything we can to uh, avoid remorse. There are some common ways that people deal with their regrets. One, we rationalize them. Here are some common rationalizations that we use. I'm not hurting anyone. I can't help the way I feel. God made me this way. God wants me to be happy. You can always tell when someone is rationalizing because you get the feeling that they're trying to convince themselves that something is okay when they know it's not. Second thing we do is uh, we try to justify. It usually it takes the form of blaming anyone or anything but oneself. Many people deal with regret by explaining all the ways it's not their fault, so it's not their responsibility. If my parents weren't so strict, if my spouse wasn't so critical, if my boss wasn't so unfair, if the culture wasn't so corrupt, we need to be very careful if we find ourselves justifying way too many of our own blunders. Number three is comparisons. People try to make themselves feel better about their regrets by comparing themselves to others. Nothing makes us feel like, we've, um, like what we've done isn't that bad of a deal, like hearing about what other people have done. It somehow uh, eases our regret when we can say, well, at least as not, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. And number four is distraction. And this is a big one. We never stop long enough to look at ourselves in the mirror. We never take the time to reflect upon the decisions we've made. We fill up every inch of our lives with work, relationship, entertainment. Uh, and if we happen to have a few spare seconds, we, we instinctively whip out our cell phones and play games and surf the web and check out social media. Another one is escapism. This is a hardcore form of distraction. If a person can't deal with the regret they feel, they might pop a few pills, smoke some weed, drink too much, or spend too much. We, we self-medicate trying to treat our guilt and numb the pain of what we have done, if only for a little while. Remorse should lead to repentance. 2 Corinthians 7.10 spells it out like this. For the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. Now catch these next few words. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow. But worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. We do not have to be imprisoned by our regrets. Jesus still has a great plan for us beyond our failings of yesterday. Grace has the power to redeem regret. Grace is powerful enough to erase your guilt. Grace is big enough to cover your shame. Grace is real enough to heal your relationships. Grace is strong enough to hold you up when you are weak. Grace is sweet enough to cure your bitterness. Grace is satisfying enough to deal with your disappointment. Grace is beautiful enough to redeem your brokenness. Grace is greater. Don't you dare miss it. Just you say it with me? Grace is greater. Grace is greater. Grace is greater. Grace is greater. Hallelujah. Worship team, come on back.
Let's pray together. Marvelous, wonderful, matchless grace is what the hymn writer said. Lord, we thank you for your wonderful, wonderful grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Thank you for the covering of your grace, dear God. Thank you for your blood that washes away our sin. Grace is greater. If you're listening here today or online, you say, I need God's grace to forgive my sin. I've never asked Jesus to come be my Savior. Why don't you do that right now? Say, Jesus, I believe your grace is greater than my sin. And your blood can wash it away. That statement of faith that the Holy Spirit has stirred in your spirits is truth. Today, regardless of what you have done, regardless, God's grace is greater. And He wants you to experience His forgiveness. He wants you to walk in it. He wants you to live in it. Lord, I thank you for those that are experiencing grace for the first time today. Lord, you are welcoming them to your family, sons and daughters of God. Thank you for your grace, Lord. Lord, I believe there are Christians that struggle with this. And Lord, they've yet to come realize that your grace is greater than their sin. So Holy Spirit, tell them this morning. Tell them what your word says. Your grace is greater. Whatever they're filling in that blank with, your grace is greater. Let healing begin to flow to them today. Lord, there are others that are experiencing a deep brokenness today. Lord, there's grace for that too. There's grace that is more beautiful than our brokenness. Lord, let it flow like a river. Let it flow like a river today. Lord, we thank you that your grace is more redemptive than our regrets. And yes, God, we're upset about the things that we've done. But Lord, they just bring us to the cross. And Lord, we're thankful that you can take all the broken pieces. And Lord, you can redeem them. You can take what is bad and broken and turn it for our good and your glory. That is grace that is greater. So Lord, help us to live in this kind of grace. And we pray it in Jesus' name today. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and sing. What else? That is amazing grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught.
first part. Here we go. Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Spirit be with you all. Amen. God bless you as you leave today.